All right, thanks very much. So I'm Mark Maimone. I've been at JPL for 23 years, and I've been fortunate to be able to work on the Mars Exploration Rover missions and Curiosity and also Mars 2020 on the flight software team developing the onboard autonomy and also on the ground operations team processing the data coming back and planning rover operations. Uh, today I'm going to just quickly review some of the information about Curiosity's mobility capabilities and I have to apologize somebody's uh, destroying some trees outside my window here. Hope, hope the noise isn't too bad. Um, so JPL has been involved with uh, four generations of Mars rovers now. We started with Sojourner in the mid-90s, and then I did two MER rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, 2004, and Curiosity landed 2012, and we're really looking forward to landing Perseverance next year. <laughs> and um, so today I want to summarize some of the uh, robotics autonomy capabilities on, on Curiosity and also the general mobility performance. So when we drive rovers on Mars, we human rover drivers have a few different ways to look at the terrain. We can look at the plane images. This is an image of JPL's Mars yard test area. Um, and we can project our simulation into the images directly. And we also build up a 3D mesh of the terrain and we can explore the terrain that way. That That's you know an interesting way to look at what's happening farther away, not, not from just the start location, but anywhere along the path. And here's an example of uh, data from Mars. This was the first day that we uh, demonstrated the autonomous driving in a, in a complete sense. We had checked it out earlier in the mission, but this was the first time we ran it to completion. Um, and I'm just showing the playback on an image taken after the drive, so you can see the tracks <coughs> underneath here. And what's interesting to note is just that um, as Curiosity drives, stops to take images and we're looking with a 40 degree field of view in these cameras. So if necessary, we'll take three, three images as we go. Um, and the distance traveled varies depending on whether we're near any obstacles or not. So curiosity will take a longer step if, if there are no obstacles, if, if it knows there are no obstacles nearby. Um, for this checkout, we artificially made these rocks, which are clearly not obstacles, uh, we, we, we lower the obstacle threshold to make it think they were obstacles, which is why you see the autonomy trying to avoid those rocks in this, this demonstration. And this is just an uh, animation of what the map it built on board looked like as it, as it was driving. So it used stereo vision to process the terrain and do its assessment of the geometry of the terrain and know where it's safe to drive and where it isn't. Green means absolutely safe, yellow is still safe, but a little rockier and red means not safe. So all of this was seen to be safe enough to drive, but it's still preferred to avoid the obstacles where it could. Here's just another, another drive just to show different kind of terrain. Um, Curiosity has been exploring over 22 kilometers now, and much of the terrain has been relatively flat, um, but with occasional um, rocks or, or other, other kinds of um, bedrock exposed. Uh, I'll show some other pictures of the, the main terrain types later. Uh, but just again, here's another illustration of the autonomy showing the path that was taken overall here. Um, as it drives, it uses stereo to update a local map of what's around it within about 10 meters. And we also have a global planner on board, the D-Star planner from Carnegie Mellon University. And that planner keeps track on a larger scale, like 50 by 50 meter scale of what's around it and how to get, get to a goal. <laughs> um, D-STAR is a capability we first demonstrated on Spirit and Opportunity, but it's really um, been, been used all the time we do autonomous driving on Curiosity. We're running with the D-STAR Global Planner available to, to help navigate any, any obstacles nearby. So just, just a quick uh, view here from a lab on Earth. When we were developing the capability back on MER, this is an engineering model of the uh, Spirit and Opportunity rovers. We set up a terrain here, didn't tell it anything about it, and it went exploring and building up a map to see where it could go. And D-Star is smart enough to figure out when it needs to backtrack and work its way around and, and also figure out when there's, there's no path to go forward. So I also wanted to mention that um, Opportunity and Curiosity have both demonstrated the ability to um, run, uh, drive across multiple planning days. 
call a, a Martian solar day, we call it a sol. And so over, uh, this is an example of a multi-sol drive that we did. Basically, we commanded uh, a long drive in, in two parts, and it drove as far as it could the first day. And when it woke up the second day, without any human in the loop, it picked up its drive and continued as it was going. <clears throat> so both missions have demonstrated that, um, but they we don't use that routinely, but it, it is available. It's, it's a tool in our toolbox, but it's not a drive mode we use all the time. And I just, I really like this animation. So this is from Opportunity. Um, this is where we first checked out the, the D-Star technology uh, near Victoria Crater that, that another presenter showed earlier. Um, and here you can see the projection of the map that it, it built on board on, onto the terrain nearby. And again, we artificially lowered the um, <clears throat> obstacle height so that it would perceive these eight centimeter rocks as hazards. That's why you see red all around them. Uh, and you're seeing the projection of the D-Star planned drive here, the, the blue drive as it's going and see how it looks on its tracks. <clears throat> so th that's the autonomous driving. Um, another robotics technology we have on board is visual odometry. And this is something that's now very common, but when we put it on 20 years ago, it was, or I guess 17 years ago, um, <clears throat> had not been as prevalent outside the robotics uh, research community. Um, but basically we, we look at the terrain, we autonomously detect features in the local terrain, move, move some distance, typically a, about a meter, and then grab another pair of images. And we do onboard processing to figure out the six degree of freedom pose change that has occurred between the images. Um, so on most terrestrial robots now, visual odometry happens at a high frame rate. So you can track features easily because frames are pretty close to each other. Uh, on Mars, it doesn't work that way. On Mars, we need more time, um, takes time to process the images. So in order to, uh, you know, prevent the necessity of taking many, many pictures and stopping often, <clears throat> we push it as far as we can. We, we often have as much as, um, or excuse me, often have as little as maybe 50% or 40% overlap between adjacent images. Um, and based on that, we're still able to recover the pose, and that gives us uh, not only good position information, but we can also derive slip knowledge from that, and that, that's important because we sometimes encounter terrains like here on Curiosity. Uh, this was the first sol where we actually started to get embedded in the soil. Um, I didn't include the picture from Opportunity, but the Opportunity mission got stuck for almost two months in terrain like this. And our experience with that led us to improve the software to monitor for things like uh, using extra current in the wheels and, and other, other tricks. Like if you're commanding a turn, are you, are you turning at the rate you expect? If not, you may be getting embedded. Um, so we use those tricks to autonomously trigger turning on a visual odometry, even if it wasn't being used in the first place. Um, and this is an example of that. This was a 100-meter drive. This was about 80 meters into it. And at the end of the drive, we hit the sandy terrain and we started to get embedded here. You can see the tracks are sort of churning up the terrain here. And because of the mode we were in, we, we noticed the, the wheel currents going, going higher. So we turned on visual odometry and it measured our progress and discovered we were slipping too much. So this is a case where an opportunity, it took two months to recover from the first embedding. Curiosity took one, one day of recovery. Um, I was actually one of the drivers the next day and we were able to get out of this in just, just a single, um, <clears throat> just a single day's activity. So, um, you know, the visual odometry is really helpful to the mission and the improved capability has improved mission operations, giving us less downtime uh, by avoiding getting stuck in circumstances like this. Uh, I'm going to switch to another slide deck. Give me just one second here. Um, so that was, that was a background of some of the technologies that we have on the uh, mission, <clears throat> and we had, we had a recent presentation earlier this year describing the mobility results for the last, uh, for, excuse me, for the first seven years of operations. It's been eight years now, but this, this covers the first seven years. Uh, so I'll just summarize some of, some of these quickly. Um, we've covered different kinds of terrain. Here are some here are the main examples. Um, sandy terrain is very infrequent. We've learned to try to avoid it. In our, our wheel system, our mobility system doesn't uh, doesn't perform as well in, in pure sand, at least not in the, the ripple covered sand that we've discovered here. Um, <clears throat> so we, we tend to avoid that, but 
everywhere else we've seen things like this with ridge terrain, ridges of, of uh, bedrock sticking out, fractured terrain with broken up broken up pieces, and and this pitted terrain where it's it's much uh, much more robust and easier easier to maneuver on. Uh, this graph shows a comparison of the odometry we've covered so far between the missions. So um, opportunity is shown in green here. This is how many how many days on Mars, how many sols on Mars that the mission has gone on. And the red is curiosity. So you can see we're fairly comparable to the previous mission. Um, in seven years, we had covered uh, 21 kilometers and obviously more since then. <laughs> um, and we're on we're on track. We we only promised to deliver you know two years of operations, and now we're we're still well into our our second extended mission here. Um, so that that's been a real benefit of these rovers lasting such a long time is we get to do more science, we get to cover cover more more mobility. Um, here's an example comparing the predicted drive against the actual performance. So. Um, on top, we have what the human rover drivers use to plan a drive for one, one sol. And you can see it's a short drive segment, just driving from here, turning, and then going uphill a little bit. Um, that was the plan, and this was done on the planning mesh created from the images um, taken near the rover. And you can contrast that with this, this, this pr um, plot, which shows an image taken three sols later. So we had moved from here away to the right of where the rover's parked and took an image looking back at the tracks. And so it's the same same drive data. This is the post drive telemetry that we have showing where the rover really went, but it's been projected onto these actual images now. And you can just see the fidelity of the planning versus the actual actual drive path. Um, I, we only have a few minutes here. I can't really get into it, but basically these are all the these are the primary driving modes that we have on the vehicle. These first four are all variations of visual odometry, either no VO or using VO all the time, basically after every meter or so of driving. <clears throat> and then these are uh, less, more occasional uses, only using VO once every 20 meters or turning it on autonomously when uh, other conditions warrant it. And you can see in this table, which is um, plotting the number of, of sols of driving, it's not, it's not a distance total, it's just number of sols. But out of all these total sols, out of 700 um, some sols in which we drove, um, most of that was done with, with this VO full mode, basically with visual odometry all the time. And you'll see a temporal breakdown in, in a future slide. Um, <clears throat> but it's just interesting because on the Mars exploration rovers, we, we did have visual odometry on board and we did use it, but it was much less frequent. Unfortunately, I don't have this breakdown to show for that, but um, basically we're using VO almost all the time in our driving now, even though it, it, with the computing we have on board, it takes some time to do processing. You basically have to stop, pause, take images, think about it, command the next drive step. That pausing, thinking in between drive steps can take 45 seconds or more. So even though that slows us down, the operations team has, has chosen to use it frequently um, because this robotics technology gives improved position knowledge, gives us slip information, makes the whole mission safer and more, um, you know, more understandable uh, to to process the data, you have less less position uncertainty to worry about when you have the VO running all the time. And we have these other drive modes like the autonomous driving, um, which has worked fine, but uh, takes even a little longer than 45 seconds at each step. So because of that, um, they've chosen to make the trade off that humans will often plan most of the driving rather than letting the autonomy do it. Uh, the autonomy is available, it does work, but it, because it takes longer, the overall drive rate is slower than uh, if, if humans spend eight hours planning each drive, you can cover distance more quickly on Mars. Uh, the other thing I'll point out here is that th this mode, this um, um, <clears throat> was added after we noticed the wheels getting getting torn up by the rocks nearby. We we modified the flight software to reduce the forces on the wheels when we're driving. Um, I think there's a whole uh, separate paper that you can read about that if you're, if you're interested. Um, this plot, again, I'll just glance over it, but just to point out that um, we, we do experience faults, things that end the drive before we, the, end, the planned end of the drive location. Um, and there's a whole variety of faults for, that can occur for different reasons. 
And this just shows what faults have occurred over time. Um, and you can look at the paper for, for the details here, but, but basically you can see that we have to deal with faults fairly regularly and they're all different kinds. Some of them are mobility, some of them are not. Um, <clears throat> summing, summing up the, the faults, you can see that most of the time uh, we have faults that are, are not related uh, to mobility um, <clears throat> or excuse me, we have expected faults most of the time. Um, an expected fault is something where you you want to stop the drive just whenever time runs out. If you have a com pass coming up, communications pass, you need to pause, so you need to stop it. That's technically a fault, even though it's a planned part of the operation. Um, but so you can see we do have different kinds to deal with over time. Um, but in spite of what looks like a lot of faults here, we've actually achieved over 91% of our commanded distance. So these faults tend to occur late and not not all that frequently, not not, not frequently enough to really diminish the, the driving. Um, here's a here's a summary based on distance of commanded drive distance, showing which drive mode we were in. And again, you can see that the visual odometry, full and auto modes, the blue and yellow here, are virtually 90% of the driving on Curiosity has been with visual odometry enabled. Um, so it, it's very nice that that robotics technology has been such a critical part of the mission planning, and it, it's, it's useful enough to the team that they've pulled it in all the time. This is the same data presented on a day-by-day -day plot. That was a cumulative plot. This is day-by-day. -day. Uh, and again, you can see the dark blue uh, really came into high use around SOL 500, and it's been in use ever since. Uh, the VO has performed really well. It's run over 20,000 frames, and it's, it's only had 94 failures, which is a success rate of like 99.96%. Uh, so it's running really well. And the, the different failure modes are understood. The most common failure mode is if you're looking at just pure sandy terrain. If there are no features to track, then it's not able to converge and give you a motion estimate. Uh, another benefit of visual odometry is it'll give you a measure of how much slip the rover is experiencing. And you can see here for, this, for the whole mission, we've experienced generally less than 20% slip. That's because we've been on this nice bedrocky terrain most of the time and at reasonably low tilts, often less than 15 degrees. Not, not always, but, but often. Uh, there are exceptions. You can see these places up here and especially in SOL 700 or so, we were, were in a terrain, the sandy terrain, where we had a lot of extra slip. Um, and over here, we had high tilt terrain that we were climbing over. So we, we do experience a variety of, of uh, tilts and slips, but most of, most of it is generally manageable, less than 20%. And just a picture of the wheels, uh, our mobility has performed well, but we, did, we were surprised to see the, the wheel skin getting torn through early in the mission after about um, a year and a half of operations. We started to see degradation here. Uh, and happily, since we've made this software update to, to um, reduce the forces on the wheels, uh, that's, that's improved things quite a bit because according to our model based on Earth-based testing, we would have expected to see a number of grouser breaks. That's the vertical axis here. How many of these, these raised pieces would break in our testing? Um, so based on ground uh, testing, we expect to, to increase at this rate. But in fact, we've seen a very slow increase on Mars. So we think that the traction control has improved things quite a bit. This testing was done with our nominal earlier drive control without that, that um, the force modeling. Um, we don't actually model forces, we just model kinematics and, and terrain, but, but the effect is to reduce the forces on the wheels. So it, it's been helping us quite a bit at, and reducing the wear rate. And we, we expect to be able to drive for another 20, 30 meters um, without issues. So other possible things that can happen on Mars is you might, um, we, we, wor we worry about getting you know entrapped in your wheels. You can see this example showing what happened in one place where um, it, it actually dislodged a wheel or a rock nearby, trying, trying to move forward. And this is just a color image showing, I'm sorry, I don't know why it keeps grabbing focus away from me here. Color image showing the terrain where we were um, around Sol 711, we were getting stuck in some sandy, sandy ripply terrain here. 
uh, we didn't actually get stuck, but our, our, we were seeing increasing slip rates, and that caused us to, to pause and back out of that terrain and find another path forward. Okay, I think I'm out of time. Um, so basically, um, we've done really well with our mobility. We've achieved over you know, 21 kilometers, uh, which is past the 20-kilometer design goal. We, we have a lot of fault protection, things that can stop a drive um, and, and have stopped it. But even in spite of that, we've achieved over 92% of the, the commanded motion that, that we wanted. Our, our, uh, our fix for the wheel forces has been working very well. It's extended. It's given us this opportunity to extend the mission and have continued mobility. Um, so we're looking forward to the next rover landing, Perseverance. And later this afternoon, we'll hear a talk about the, uh, the planning system for, for the uh, Perseverance rover. So thanks very much. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank, thanks a lot, Mark. Um, so there's, there are quite a few questions in the chat. I'll, I'll ask one now in the interest of time, and then we'll push everything else to the, the panel discussion. Um, I'm looking for a question that I don't think you addressed. Uh, so from Krishna Sony, what are the parameters used to plan the autonomous uh, planning? Uh, what are the parameters used in the autonomous planning? Is it just the size of rocks or does it take into consideration other factors such as wheel slip? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the autonomy really relies on the geometry of the terrain. So we have stereo, uh, vision giving us a dense map of the, of the terrain shape nearby and it's really just based on th that terrain shape that, that we do our autonomy um, we use slip uh, um, on board as a fault detector uh, but so far we're not using it as a planning component of the autonomy uh, we, we certainly considered that but um, so far we haven't um, found it necessary to incorporate that in, into our planning software yet but that that, that is a definitely interesting thing and you know planning based on slip could help you avoid certain regions altogether without even getting into it so it, it, it would be a nice capability to have but we've done very well without it and we haven't been, we haven't found the need to incorporate that yet 